time is more or less on time or a little bit later so we may have to stragger just the next five minutes but let me welcome you to this evening's talk and introduce our speaker this evening who is going to be talking to us about the future of relations between the United States and Europe we're quite fortunate to have someone here who is able to speak with some authority on this topic Anthony Hartley, who, as you doubtless will be able to tell shortly, is himself English, has lived in the United States uh, part of his life and therefore is familiar with American audiences and has friends in this country. Uh, he has a considerable background in British journalism and has worked in one capacity or another with a variety of English publications, including the well-known weekly magazine, The Economist, also the Manchester Guardian, or officially as it now has more recently been called The Guardian, The Spectator and Encounter magazine, and has served in capacities such as assistant editor, a diplomatic correspondent, uh, and so forth. For the last several years, he has been the deputy director of the Common Market uh, London office, and as such has had considerable uh, contact with the uh, British relations with the common market and also with the general development of the common market and therefore is particularly well placed to be able to speak about the subject of relations between the United States and Europe which increasingly are questions about relationships between <clears throat> the U.S. and the common market as an international organization. We're quite pleased to have Mr. Hartley with us and without any further delay I will introduce him. Mr. Hartley. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, some of you are old enough, but others are not, no doubt, to remember that during the Second World War, a book was published by Mr. Wendell Wilkie called One World. And in that book, Mr. Wilkie foresaw a state which we now call intertentical interdependence. That is, he foresaw that the effect, what one country did in a world system might be felt as pleasure or pain down in the nerves of another country, in fact, throughout the whole international system, international economic system. He felt in that book, he had the intuition that we had to interest ourselves in what others do and in their condition. And we do indeed have one world today, and most recently we saw it during the energy crisis of 1973 and 74. But Mr. Wilkie's vision of the future was very much that of what I think in German is called a Lieberfest, and I think in California is called a Lovin. Um, he, I mean, reg regarded the whole thing through a sort of rosy mist and thought that this condition of being one world was going to be a pleasant reality. What we now see, of course, is that it isn't quite so pleasant. It's much more like living in an apartment next door to some people who have a very little sense of noise and a very powerful hi-fi system. The, um, we have, I think, uh, as it were, interdependence for irritation. We don't necessarily have interdependence for cooperation or indeed even for mutual tolerance. Uh, Dean Swift once wrote, we have just enough religion to make us hate one another and not enough to make us love one another. And it is not a very easy matter living alongside one's neighbor in a world where economic conditions make the game of beggar my neighbor very tempting. Um, I think, you know, that we've heard a lot of these difficulties over the past few years. I always one hears of bickerings between America and Europe back and forth across the Atlantic. In a minute, I will outline some of the changes that have taken place since the mid-60s in Atlantic relations and the enormous problems which, was, which came up in a way rather unexpectedly and caused an evolution in world politics. But I think one ought to note that um, 
Such problems make it necessary for governments and for statesmen to change their views and change their attitudes. And a lot of the irritation we sometimes feel may be explained if you will notice that it isn't, maybe you have noticed that that kind of adaptation is not the easiest thing in the world for politicians who become accustomed to old landmarks, so accustomed to them that they take them for granted. Now, I don't want to talk too much about past history, but I think it is necessary to understand something of what the origin, if you like, or the beginnings of what we call Atlantic relations now once were, as it were, after 1945. Um, when I speak of Europe, incidentally, when I speak of Europe, uh, obviously I mean in the first place the nine countries of the European community. That is France, Germany, Italy, Great Britain, Benelux, Ireland, and Denmark. Um, but of course, one also means when one talks of Europe and America, the security relationship of the North Atlantic Alliance. And one then comes up against one of these little difficulties that's constantly afflicting writers on international affairs. You have Ireland, which is, not, which is a member of the European community, but is not a member of NATO. You have uh, Norway, which is a member of NATO, but is not a member of the European community. And so I don't propose throughout what I'm now going to say to constantly be saying, except Norway or except Ireland, because this would merely irritate everybody and myself, first of all. So that um, there is this uh, sort of overlap. I mean, and people don't invariably belong to the same organization. All the same people don't belong to the same organizations, as you well know. Um, so that, in a sense, you know, security relations between Europe and America are taken care of in the North Atlantic Alliance, and economic relations between uh, America and the European community. But, of course, in fact, since there is an overlap, I mean, since most of the countries of the European community belong to the North Atlantic Alliance and vice versa, uh, you can see that, you know, by and large, it is perfectly all right to talk of Europe and the United States. In a sense, you could say that in economic terms, it is the European community which represents Europe in Atlantic relations. Well, in 1945, Western Europe found itself devastated and with rather an unpleasant inheritance of memories after the Second World War. In 10 years, however, it had recovered, and it had recovered really for two major reasons. For in the first place, for its own hard work and ingenuity, and in the second place, because of an extremely generous and far-sighted American policy, which was embodied in martial aid, which aided Western Europe economically, and in the North Atlantic Treaty, which as it were, stabilized Europe politically and freed it of the military threat, which at that time, you know, uh, was thought by most Europeans at any rate to exist, a military threat from the East, and uh, provided, so to speak, an area of stability in which economic prosperity could grow, because quite clearly you do not invest in an area which you think is about to be knocked off either by an external enemy or by internal revolution. So, in a sense, this political stability assured by NATO was a condition of the economic growth which one saw in Europe in the 50s and 60s. In a sense, the world in which both Europe and the United States lived from 1945 to 1965 was largely directed by American ideas. The post-war economic system, dictated by such agreements as Bretton Woods, which founded the International Monetary Fund, and the foundation of organizations as a, such as the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, these kind of agreements were largely produced towards the end of the Second World War at the instance of the United States, because it was the United States uh, which had, so to speak, sufficient energy 
and in a certain sense sufficient vision uh, at the end of the world, Second World War to think of them. And so, in a sense, for some time, um, for 20 years after the war, one had a world directed according to an American world economic system and largely due to American ideas. And this worked very well. And I think it is necessary to say at a time when American foreign policy is very often criticized in the United States that the immediate post-war American policy in, in Europe was a highly imaginative and successful and uh, idealistic, if you like, effort um, on the part of statesmen such as uh, George Marshall, Dean Acheson, President Truman, and so on. And um, this, I mean, as I say, one, it really was extremely successful. It was aimed at producing stability and prosperity in Western Europe. It did so. And this is a condition which has largely lasted from 1945 until the present day. The, of course, I mean, the United States obviously had an aim in doing this. It wasn't total philanthropy. Uh, but it was on the part of the United States common sense, which is something which quite frequently, of course, gets left out of foreign policies. And I think that it's something which Americans can regard as an achievement. At this time, uh, the Europeans began to put forward their own views on the question of European unity. Uh, in 1951, largely at the impulsion of Mr. Jean Monnet, who was a great man, um, the European Coal and Steel Community was created, uh, and the objective of which was to pool the coal and steel resources between six countries. Uh, France, Italy, Germany, and Benelux at that time, and uh, to uh, put over the oil and steel, over the coal and steel community, over the coal and steel resources of those countries, a kind of a high commission which would develop them, rationalize them, improve the social conditions in them, and so on and so forth. Later on, I mean, this was successful later on, the European Economic Community was founded in 1957 by the signature of the Treaty of Rome. And this process, this process of European, un European unification was supported by the United States for a variety of reasons. I think Americans saw in this, they certainly saw in it an economic basis for the existence of the North Atlantic Alliance. They saw in it something analogous to their own history, the production of a sort of federalism in Europe. And they also saw in it a practical plan which would continue to strengthen the European economy by creating a single market and a wider market, producing economies of scale, and by moving away from the old hatreds that had nearly destroyed the continent. I think in a way, though, that the United States, the first thing they saw in European unity was what people like Monsieur Monet and others saw in it, was reconstruction and reconciliation. That was what was perceived in the movement towards it. Both of these, of course, were also perceived by the United States as objectives of their own foreign policy. And I think, in a way, it's true to say that in the United States, uh, the consequences of European uni unity were far more clearly perceived than in Europe itself. Or rather, they were, seen up, they were seen fairly clearly up to a point, and of course no one can completely foresee the future. I don't think that Americans completely realized the consequences of supporting European unity. I don't think that at that time they had much idea that uh, this support might eventually lead to a point where Europeans would try to pursue their own policies in terms of things like dialogues with the Soviet Union, where they might become serious rivals in trade, and so on and so forth. 
I think that in one of his books, Mr. George Ball, who was one of the chief architects of all this in terms of American policy, in one of his books, he says that he did not completely see, foresee what was going to happen or the consequences of uniting Europe. I think that they thought, people in the State Department at that time, that there would sort of be a miraculous coincidence of views between the United States and the unifying Europe. Well, of course, these things never take place quite in that way. From the American point of view, actually, you could regard, I suppose, Europe in two ways. You can regard it either as Pygmalion regarded his statue, which came to life, or you can regard it as sort of Frankenstein's monster, which also came to life, but in a rather less agreeable fashion. The paradoxes of American policy were well put by Dr. Kissinger in the mid-60s in his book on the Atlantic Alliance. He said, American policy has been extremely ambivalent. It has urged European unity while recoiling before its probable consequences. We have sought to combine a supranational Europe with a closely integrated Atlantic community under American leadership. These objectives are likely to prove incompatible. Well, one can see how inevitable these difficulties were. And the Europeans were worried about American negotiations with the Soviet Union. For their part, Americans certainly did not want the Europeans, so to speak, running between their legs at the moment when they were doing rather a delicate balancing act in terms of their relationship with the Soviet Union. Americans felt that European economic unity was going to be made at their expense and it was going to put up another economic block and we all know that economic blocks are a bad thing. These, however, I think, had their, these trends had their full effect later. And for the time being, American policy culminated in the two pillars concept of the Kennedy administration. The idea being that on the one side of the Atlantic you had the United States, on the other side you had a united Europe which in some sense could act as a real partner to the United States and when there would be no disproportion in weight or disproportion in power. And that was the view of the Kennedy administration. Like many views of the Kennedy administration, it was a very ambitious concept and we now can see perhaps that it must have been overambitious because things immediately started going wrong. Now, if one takes uh, between 1960, the decade between 1965 and 1975, one can see that it was a decade with enormous changes in international affairs. And a number of these changes directly affected relations between Europe and the United States, so I should briefly list them. Well, the first clearly was that from about 1965 onwards, the United States was preoccupied, and I might almost say obsessed, by the Vietnam War. Um, so that, in a sense, American diplomacy neglected Europe. I mean, the last major plan put forward was the ill-fated one for the mixed man nuclear force, the so-called MLF. And this was abandoned by the Johnson administration. I mean, it probably wouldn't have worked anyhow, but at any rate, it was let drop by the Johnson administration. And from then until 1975, there wasn't much, 1973, I beg your pardon, there wasn't much in the way of a sort of American view of Europe expressed in policies. Another consequence, and a more serious consequence, a more lasting consequence of the Vietnam War was a re-examination by the American public, or in the mind of the American public, of American commitments overseas. There was a disinclination to get into new ones and a feeling that allies ought to bear more of the burden of their own defense. Moreover, uh, the coming to power of the Nixon administration in 1969, beginning of 1969, reduced, uh, removed from the State Department and from other American government agencies a lot of the familiar faces whom Europeans have been accustomed to really since 1946-47 many of the diplomatic officials who had, so to speak, uh, grown up with policies like the Marshall Plan and so on, ever since the immediate post-war period, ceased to be in positions of 
power and influence after 1969. Then, a more substantive thing, the 70s saw the beginnings of a breakdown of the post-war economic system. The abandon abandonment of fixed parities between currencies in August 1971, I mean, in fact, the United States, I don't know if you've ever seen a film by René Clair in which you have a lot of people at an official opening, they're standing around in their top hats and morning coats, and a whole lot of currency starts to blow down from a neighboring roof where you know, the plot of the thing has been, it's been stashed there by a lot of thieves. And anyway, you see all these people watching these banknotes going back and forth. And there is one who is holding all the others back from making a dive for them. And suddenly he makes a dive for them himself. And then all the others. Anyway, but the point is, this was very much the manner in which the United States acted about the international monetary system. Because, I mean, up to, up to August 1971, the United States was holding everybody back and saying, well, no, no, you must observe the Bretton, the Bretton Woods system, must keep the system going. And then suddenly, you know, the United States devalued the dollar on which the whole thing depended. And that really marked the end of the post-war monetary era, and it marked the end of monetary stability. Not, I think, entirely, you know, for, for everybody's benefit. And anyway, the, this, this uh, process was completed by the energy crisis of 73 and 74 and its effects in causing inflation. And then, for the, for the first time, international economic cooperation was being tested in adverse circumstances, and unfortunately, it was often found wanting. On the European side, I mean, there was the enlargement of the European Economic Community when Britain, Denmark, and Ireland joined it in the beginning of 1973. And this also produced problems. And there were problems which were so absorbing that it was very hard for America's allies to play their full part in any world scene. And, of course, the opposition of the goal to the supranational elements of the European Community in the 60s had rather changed the Treaty of Rome or what was originally intended. And um, from the American point of view, I think it must have looked very much as though the community was in fact stagnating on the other side, I mean, from the other side of the Atlantic. And I think, of course, it's quite evident, well, it is in fact quite evident to me from my own personal experience, that Americans have become somewhat disillusioned with the European common market. And I think at any rate, that feeling certainly added to the complication of American-European relations during the 70s. It had always been a part of American policy that America was only willing to accept economic damage to its trading interests as a result of the construction of European unity if the Europeans in their turn were doing something interesting in terms of political unity, which might, as it were, take a certain load off the United States as far as European security was concerned, and which would also increase stability in Western Europe. I think by 1973, domestic problems on both sides of the Atlantic and a colder economic climate had created an atmosphere which made it fairly easy to be concerned with one's own problems and more difficult to be concerned with those of others. On the defense side, of course, also. I mean, the United States was feeling, and I think you know, Senator Mansfield at that time expressed this feeling in a rather typical manner, that it was unnatural for America to keep so many troops in Europe nearly 30 years after the end of World War II. And again, I mean, the sort of continuing dialogue between America and the Soviet Union had raised fears in Europe. It was at this point that Dr. Kissinger turned his attention to American-European relations and announced the so-called Year of Europe in 1973. The Vietnam War having ended, he turned his attention to that. And since the mid-60s, indeed, American-European relations had been suffering from certainly that more than their fair share of benign neglect, or not so benign neglect. 
Unfortunately, the year of Europe did not justify the hopes placed in it. And I think, you know, that um, in fact, it, it was a sort of minor disaster. It might have gone okay. One could have imagined that outstanding economic differences could have been resolved during the year of Europe. As it was, however, uh, Dr. Kissinger decided to begin it with a rather more general definition of American-European relations. And in a speech on April 23rd, 1973, he offered a new Atlantic Charter setting goals for the future, which builds on the past without becoming its prisoner, deals with the problems our success has created, creates for the Atlantic nations a new relationship in whose progress Japan can share. And one might immediate, one must immediately say the Japanese refused to do anything of the sort and made it quite apparent quite soon that they were not interested at all. So one can dismiss the Japanese from the consideration of this. Um, of course, there were a number of errors and misconceptions here. Uh, this offer on the part of Dr. Kissinger came before the trade negotiations in the general context of the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which were due to open in September of that year. They therefore looked like a pre-negotiating position and indeed, you know, a somewhat of an adversary position. And this impression, of course, was not diminished by the fact that the speech contained a number of rather derogatory remarks about Europeans. Um, uh, Dr. Kissinger said, the United States has global interests and responsibilities. Our European allies have regional interests. But when you talk about yourself as having responsibilities and other people as having interests, I mean, this can, you know, it is not unnatural for the other people to take it as a preliminary to your twisting their arm in some way. Also, by asking for a new Atlantic Charter, Dr. Kissinger, I think, risked laying the stress on theoretical differences about the definition of Atlantic relations. Um, if when you draw up a charter, basically you are of that kind, or a document of that kind, you are, so to speak, into political theology at that point. Uh, you are not, as it were, talking about practical matters. And you're talking in this, this particular instance about uh, you were trying to draw up definitions which would be peculiarly difficult for a country like France, which had in fact left the foreign policy which was bequeathed to it by General de Gaulle, but had, was not yet prepared to say so openly. Uh, to try to define publicly the nature of Atlantic relations was to create the maximum of difficulties for everybody concerned. Also, by wishing simultaneously to deal with economic and political problems, the speech made it appear as though the United States wished to link the negoti future negotiations in GATT with matters such as the American military presence in Europe. This is the so-called linkage question, which was bound to arouse European suspicions, since in a sense, after all, I mean, in these kind of things, one man's, one man's linkage, you could say, is, is another man's blackmail. Um, and I think, you know, the year of Europe therefore got off to a bad, a bad footing, and Europeans thought Americans or the American offer patronizing and potentially dictatorial, and Americans thought Europeans obstructive and suspicious. Then there was the energy crisis and the Arab-Israeli war in the autumn of the same year. And Europeans proceeded to panic rather badly at the thought of their oil supplies being cut off. Not only were they disunited among themselves, but they also refused to allow their installations to be used by American planes flying equipment to Israel. I suppose the panic was understandable, but all one can say is that European countries and European statesmen did not emerge from this particular trial with dignity. And it was understandable that Dr. Kissinger should carefully, should, you know, should be annoyed and should have rather carefully leaked that annoyance to the press. I think it's better to forget these comments 
But there was one point made at that time by Dr. Kissinger, which I think is of some interest, because it does raise a general question about the European community's position in the world. He complained in a speech that to present the decisions of a unifying Europe to us as fait accompli, not subject to effective discussion, is alien to the tradition of US-European relations. Well, what he meant by that was this, that at any international negotiation, when the nine countries of the European community arrive at it, they arrive having previously reached an agreement among themselves, often with some difficulty. And because they've previously reached an agreement among themselves, they can't alter that agreement when they go into a council chamber with other people, not without retiring and thrashing out the alteration between themselves again. So that there is bound to be a certain rigidity in their attitude. And this, I think, you know, is a fact of international life. One can't wish away other people's political systems. One might note that the irritation felt at it by American negotiators is rather analogous to the sort of irritation that is felt by Europeans often when American negotiators say Congress will never hear of this about some trade matter. Of course, of course it is often suspected that what is meant is Congress shall never hear of this. And, um, you know, I think probably Europeans, too, use their own rigidities as an excuse in the same way as the State Department does about Congress. Um, but it, these unity, this unity, this European unity, is a fact of international life. One has to accept it, just as allies of the United States have to accept, you know, a kind of slight awkwardness of having to get things past Congress. Well, in fact, actually, the, the damage done to European-American relations in 73 was repaired rather rapidly. There was, in June 1974, the New Atlantic Charter was signed at a NATO meeting, which was what the Europeans wanted. They wanted it to be associated with NATO and not just out on its own. And. Um, there was no mention of any linkage between military and economic issues, and the development of European unity was recognized as having a beneficial effect on the alliance. There was also an agreement reached on the compensation due to the United States, the United States in trade terms, for the enlargement of the community. At present, I would say that the three main statesmen of the European community Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, and Mr. Callaghan, Mr. James Callaghan, can all be described as Atlantic um, in their orientation. I mean, they're all very much, I would say, friends of the United States and attach enormous importance to good relations with it. And the United States Treasury don't know in advance. Therefore, the present position or relations between America and Europe is one of rel relative stability. I take it that we shall have to wait the result of next month's presidential election, the next United States administration, before knowing what the future will hold. Meanwhile, there is cooperation in appropriate international institutions. I have often been asked while going around the United States what difference Europeans feel that the result of the presidential election would make. Well, I mean, it's extremely hard to know. Um, on the one hand, you know, you have an incumbent who you've got to know. On the other hand, um, Mr. Carter is surrounded with a lot of foreign policy figures whom Europeans have come to know pretty well. Uh, there is also the question, of course, um, the, you know, the fact of the matter is that what Europeans really want an American president to be is fairly strong, able to kind of work in cooperation with Congress, able to get his political measures through Congress if possible, uh, so that dealing with the United States government becomes a matter in which American representatives in international affairs can, on the whole, get accepted by American opinion uh, the policies which 
they are putting to their Atlantic partners. Because otherwise, you run into enormous difficulties if you agree something and then find it is being repudiated and so on. I mean, we in Europe would like an American administration which is, continues to be convinced of the usefulness of the Atlantic Alliance and which perhaps continues to be convinced of the usefulness of the European Economic Community. I think, of course, that the United States has a great deal to gain from the European Economic Community. And I think one can see this if one looks a little bit at the position of trade between the United States and Europe. Well, in 1975, I, now, I will now actually depart from my normal custom and quote a few statistics. Uh, in 1975, United States trade with the rest of the world was in surplus to the extent of $11 billion. At that time, the EC states had a deficit of $2.5 billion. That actually was better than 74 when they did very disastrously because of the oil crisis. At that time, 1974, the EC took 21.9% of the United States exports, which is a very sizable figure. The United States itself took 19% of European exports. But in 1974-75, American imports from the EC fell by about $2 billion. And in 1974, there was a United States surplus in trade of over $5 billion with the EC. In 75, that surplus was about six billion. America once had great fears, the United States had great fears about its agricultural trade with Europe. But in the agricultural sector, the balance of trade has been permanently favorable to the United States, with surpluses from 1973 to 75 of between three billion and five billion dollars. In 1975, the United States Bought from the uh, EC, sorry, bought from the United States exactly five times more agricultural products than it sold. And recently, this situation has been complained of by Monsieur Laudinois, the Commissioner for Agriculture, in a speech at Monterey. He was talking rather, so to speak, appropriately to the Soya Bean Association. Uh, and he complained of the exclusion from the American market of many EEC agricultural products. And I, I give you one or two examples. In one example is, for example, the only EEC country really to export meat to the United States has been Ireland. But between 1974 and 1975, Irish exports were cut from 18,000 tons to 3,000 tons. And that, of course, has a considerable impact on the agriculture of a rather small country. Um, it has been said that um, the tax now imposed by the EC on vegetable oils will unfavorably affect American soya beans. But in fact, there has been no halt in the rise of soya bean imports into Europe. And this seems a fair point when estimating the effect of such taxes on American farmers. I, well, I know, of course, that there are always two sides to any question, but what I'm really pointing out here is that Americans, and more especially the American farmer, and you know, when he's speaking here in Iowa, more especially the American farmer, has had a good deal from the European community, basically. It has been a good market, and it has not been a particularly pressing competitor. Certainly, I mean, trade, agree trade negotiations bring out the worst in us all. But I think that the uh, United States has found an advantageous trading partner in the European community. There are a good deal of argument. There's a constant sort of what I would call a sort of crackle of musketry fire along the front about tariffs and about customs procedures and all that kind of thing. Obviously, I mean, there are some trade problems which are not easily solvable. Now, if you take the question of trade with Japan, which has nothing to do with America or Europe, uh, the Japanese government claims that the Japanese market is open to consumer durables and motor cars and things of that kind from other countries. But you just try to sell these to Japan, 
And you will see what barriers, language, cultural habits, um, nationalist cohesion, and so on can put in your way. And this you're selling, you know, an item which has some speciality snob value, I mean, or T-shirts marked Yale or something of the kind. Um, you cannot really break into the Japanese market in competition with Japanese firms. And this creates, I mean, if you've seen that the Japanese surplus on its balance of payments has gone up by five times, I think it was in the paper a couple of days ago, I mean, this is how this occurs. And um, you get these kind of things occurring, and which are essentially, in a way, political and cultural. As between Europe and the United States, sort of habits, some habits of this kind, some so-called non-tariff barriers, these kind of obstacles are often felt as unfair. But of course, people very rarely pay attention to the political difficulties of others in these matters. And I think all these things can be resolved. They resolved at the expense of long, tedious, and continual negotiations between the European Economic Community and the United States. One would hope that they would, these would be uh, conducted with good humor. In fact, uh, since Dr. Kissinger's Year of Europe, two of the features which the United States complained of have been removed from European policy. The so-called reverse preferences with the associated African countries is one. You know, uh, the European community has, has negotiated association agreements with a large range of African countries, 46 under the new Lomé agreements. And the earlier agreements which Lomé replaced caused these African and African countries to give to European goods, community goods, a preference in their markets. And this was not unnaturally objected to by the United States as a threat to American trade. Now, under the new Lomé agreements, with 46 countries from Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific, these reverse preferences have been dropped. Similarly, as I've pointed out, the American fears about, their agri about agricultural exports have been, should have been set to rest. Moreover, the world food situation has changed. It seems, I mean, there are, I think, now between two weeks and a month's grain in stock in the world. I, I'm open to correction on these figures, but this is, it seemed to me when I last heard of it, it was about that. And, um, Therefore, I know it seems to be little difficulty with new buyers for food coming along in disposing of surpluses. Uh, therefore, the conditions of the problem have changed. When the United States sells soybeans to the Europeans, it is now not so much the United States that is pushing for more and more soybeans. It is Europeans who are wishing to have assured sources of supply and wishing to negotiate long-term contracts. And in a way, the action of the Nixon administration in stopping the export of soya beans at one, one point uh, did shoot a large hole in the American case for more freedom of trade in agricultural products. Anyhow, uh, at the moment, it seems to me that there are few subjects of economic dispute between Europe and America. The question is, of course, what are the future? Now, when one looks at the future, I can see subjects which we might quarrel about, but I can also see problems which we more or less have to solve together. I mean, what are the problems coming up in the world economy and so on? Well, there is the problem of energy, and already, of course, one has this International Energy Committee, which sits and is, for the moment, concerning itself with contingency plans in case there should be another oil embargo. There is the question of the law of the sea. I mean, Europeans and Americans, I think, have to agree on this, because if anyone imagines that the ships that used to be owned by the late Mr. Howard Hughes can scull around the Pacific, fishing up ingots of minerals from the seabed indefinitely, they're wrong. I mean, some more equitable arrangement is going to be required and an arrangement in which a number of the developing countries share in the exploitation of the riches of the seabed. I don't think that the countries which happen to have the technology 
can use that power and technology as a form of power for simply grabbing this. And this, I think, has to be the, the subject of discussion and agreement between, uh, between America and Europe, certainly at one point. Uh, thirdly, I suppose that you could say there is the question of commodities, because already what one has seen with OPEC and oil prices, you have a cartel of oil producers fixing the prices. You have the makings of a cartel of aluminum producers, bauxite producers, also fixing the prices. Uh, you will have cartels, other cartels, fixing, doing price fixing. And I think that while certainly the developing countries who produce these commodities should receive a reasonable, uh, a reasonable amount for their production and should the market should be stabilized so that they don't know these great falls and rises in price which they've known in the past, uh, the market should be stabilized. But I think that at this point the industrial countries have a certain have a right to ask that their economic position should be stabilized by long-term long contracts of supply. But to do this, industrial countries must get together. Now, these are three economic areas. And I mean, leaving aside things like the getting rid of the non-tariff barriers and so forth, which will continue. Discussions in GATT, discussions in the International Monetary Fund with relation to producing greater monetary stability, all these things will continue. But these are three new areas, uh, energy, commodities, and the, the sea, the ocean, in which it seems to me that Americans and Europeans have every interest in talking to each other. Um, certainly, we shall not get anywhere if we don't talk to each other. At the beginning of this lecture, I used the metaphor of the noisy neighbors with the hi-fi system. And I think, you know, that when you do have neighbors of this kind, it is probably the wrong policy to retire into your apartment, drink yourself senseless with rage and martinis. And, um, you know, uh, but I think one should at this point try to talk to one's neighbors and explain that the walls are rather thin and so on. I always feel the same in international relations. I think it is all right as long as we are talking to one another, uh, but this does not necessarily mean leaking things to the press before they're communicated. And it will not be all right, however, if we get enormously annoyed about very small irritations. Those irritations are certainly going to come. But it will not make for a healthy international system if on every occasion when some moment of crisis occurs, the United States and the Europeans fly off the handle and fly into rages with each other. And if we do not sufficiently know each other's minds to decide in advance what degree of harmonization of our policies is necessary. Well, I think I will leave you with that particular thought, because I think I may have gone on rather too long. And if anybody has any questions, I should be delighted to answer them. I think we should thank Mr. Hartley for having uh, given us such a concise picture of where we have been, where we are, and some of the options or alternatives of where we might go from this point on. In so doing, he very early on suggested sort of two polar extremes, uh, which rather defined what some of the uh, extreme possibilities were. On the one hand, you remember his contrast between Frankenstein and Pygmalion, also, the contrast, which he came back to in the end, between integration for irritation or integration for cooperation. Uh, this, then, is sort of the range within, this, uh, within which this relation between the United States and Europe potentially has fluctuated in the past and can in the future. Nonetheless, given the amount of time available for his talk tonight, he was not obviously able to cover everything, and there probably are some questions which he did not have time to touch upon that you would like to ask uh, for some further elucidation on. So if you would like to uh, address your questions to him,
uh, do please speak up so that everyone can hear the question so it won't be necessary for him to repeat them. Well, I think I mean, the French, you know, under General de Gaulle did in fact pull out of NATO, yes, certainly. Well, there's a distinction. They pulled out of the military organization of NATO rather than actually out of the alliance. Um, and, uh, but I would think that, you know, for the last two or three years, in practice, the French have been going back into NATO. Now, President Giscard d'Estaing cannot actually say this publicly because he would run into great difficulties with the residual, so to speak, heritage or inheritance from the girl. Uh, but in practice, I mean, there is a far greater degree of cooperation between France and NATO than there was. I mean, French officers take part in all the meetings, French troops take, take part in some of the maneuvers and so on and so forth. Um, there is a, a specific point, I think, which is that the French tactical nuclear missile, Pluto, has always been stationed in eastern France. And it is a complaint of the Germans that given its range, the only place it could possibly land is on, at an enemy going through western Germany, which would entail the destruction of those areas of western Germany. I mean, you know, there's, there's sort of ambiguous situation because I mean, the French cannot easily station Pluto on German soil without integrating it into the NATO command. In fact, I mean, the Germans are not willing to have it there unless it is integrated into the NATO command. And so the only place they can station it is in eastern France. Now, I mean, one presumes that I mean, if a war broke out in Europe, they would have plans for moving it forward. But uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean this, is, this is obviously a sort of paradoxical situation. And one, uh, you know, Really, I mean, it is, in a sense, the result of pursuing a foreign policy which uh, is not entirely what it seems. I mean, on one level, you're pursuing a certain foreign policy, but your rhetoric about it and what you actually say is slightly different. I think maybe that's it. I didn't, I, didn't th I, I didn't think that, actually. I mean, they may have reduced them because, you know, the French army has rather been reduced in size. I think military service has been cut and things a bit. But it's, uh, you know, the French, I mean, French have spent rather less on conventional weapons. They've spent quite a lot on acquiring their own nuclear striking force, which is, of course, composed of submarines and, you know, and long-range ballistic missiles and so on. But, I mean, they may have pulled some troops out of France simply because they hadn't got so many troops in all. But, I mean, out of Germany. So, but, I mean, the, the point, the whole, one of the points about stationing troops anywhere is that you might just as well keep them in somebody else's country as your own, really. Because uh, it's no, unless you're actually going to demobilize them, it's no more expensive keeping them anywhere else, you know. Uh, therefore, we might as well have them where they can do some good which is really the case about American troops in Germany too, in fact. I mean, unless America was were proposing to dispose of the divisions which it has in Germany, or sort of completely close them down, so to speak, which I think it's not about to because they're a sizable part of the American army, they might just as well be kept in Germany as in the United States. And in fact, since the Germans make a contribution towards their upkeep in Germany, it is quite considerably cheaper. Well, I mean, the, the present position is as follows, that the Greeks have applied for membership and negotiations have begun with one formal meeting in July 
and you know, will negotiations presumably will now con are now continuing. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen any, but that's just any, any announcement of this. But that's just because I haven't been there in London over the last month. Uh, the Portuguese have sort of indicated their intention of applying. Um, the Spaniards will almost certainly apply after the Spanish elections, which are likely to take place in the summer. And it says, well, if you have a democratically elected Spanish government, there would then be no grounds for the European community to refuse to entertain negotiations with Spain. And Spain perhaps poses the least of the economic problems, actually, because Spain during the 60s had a very effective kind of industrial revolution of its own, as you know. And then there's Turkey. And there is, of course, a promise to Turkey in the association agreement with Turkey that this could be a step towards membership. Well, I mean, this, of course, does, there is a considerable problem here in all this because you're taking in four Mediterranean countries whose bureaucratic habits, to put it mildly, are very different from those of Northern Europe. You're taking in four countries which all produce the same things, I mean, sort of oil, wine, uh, you know, olive oil, wine, citrus fruits, and so on. You're taking in four poor countries, I mean, the gross national product per capita of Greece is about that of Ireland. Um, the, uh, the similar figure in Portugal is 50% of that of Greece. I mean, Turkey, if you were to take in Turkey, by about 1985, Turkey will have the largest population of any country in the European community. I mean, it's, at the minute, it's 40 million, increasing by 3% per year. And you know, I haven't got my calculator on me, but in fact, I mean, if you work this out, it really, it probably comes out you know, somewhere around 60 million. You know, it's geometrical progression, therefore it comes out somewhere around 60 million in the mid 80s. And, um, you know, of which 50% are illiterate, all are Muslim, and so on. I mean, I mean, I mean this, this is a very, a, a, a very difficult question. I mean, quite apart from the fact that all these new states coming in would mean that the whole of the commission would have to be organized in some very different manner. I mean, you couldn't possibly have 19 commissioners. It's too large a body to deliberate. And um, the common agricultural policy might have to have a special Mediterranean zone added to it, which would be very difficult because it would open enormous opportunities for fraud. And so on. I mean, I, you know, I don't know how this is to work out. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that you can only feed an ostrich just so many stones. And after you've fed it so many stones, it sort of keels over. Its digestion is not proof against everything. And uh, the European community is really the same thing. I, you know, I'm not sure how many new members it can take. And the, um, I mean, the reasons for this, the commission gave a rather hostile opinion about Greek membership. Recommendation that there should be an enormous, a very, very long interim period. And, uh, the, <clears throat> and the reason why this was overridden, of course, by the foreign ministers in the European Council was absolutely clear. I mean, you know, they wish to keep Mr. Karamandis where he is. Mr. Karamandis is threatened by another military coup d'etat, very probably. Similarly with Portugal, I mean, a lot of Western blood and treasure has been expended on putting Dr. Suarez where he is. With Spain, one would wish to sort of, you know, help the process of democratization of Spain in the sort of post-Franco era, and so on. So there were strong political reasons for using the European community as a kind of sort of instrument for buttressing the stability, political stability of those countries. But of course, I mean, um, there is a limit to this process. I mean, it would not be terribly productive, it would be counterproductive if the European community itself had imparted to it some of the political instability of those countries. And I don't know what is going to happen here, but I do know, that, I mean, if, if this, this particular enlargement takes place, and the character of the European community and the character of its institutions is going to change in rather unpredictable ways. It's rather hard to see what will happen. <laughs>
Well, I think actually that, you know, as far as regards the EC, a communist Italy wouldn't produce all that amount of problem. It might produce some, but I mean, unless it, but of course, if it introduced, as it were, an East European type economic policy, then clearly it couldn't remain inside the EC because the EC is based on, you know, fair, a free trade concept and not on rigid controls of imports, exports, and so on and so forth. Uh, I doubt, actually, if they would do this, the Italian communists. I think membership of the European community is too valuable to Italy to be likely discarded. Um, NATO, of course, the thing is much more difficult. I mean, it does, does seem to me if, you know, if an Italian communist minister of defense turns up at NATO, he's not going to be fighting to welcome by anybody. Uh, because in a way, I mean, you know, whatever the rifts between Moscow and the Italian Communist Party may be, and I think they are genuine, and I think they're considerable, uh, and ultimately speaking, they're possibly decisive in certain respects. But, I mean, the fact of the matter is, of course, that the last relationship which breaks down between the Russians and the West European Communist Party is the imparting of intelligence. And so that, you know, one couldn't really expect that the Italian communists should be regarded as particularly welcome participants in any secret NATO meeting. I mean, this, this, is, this is for sure. And one can understand Dr. Kissinger on that point. Well, no, I think not. Well, I don't think Americans would be terribly favorable for reducing tactical weapons for Soviet tanks because Soviet tanks are now becoming, you know, obsolete, whereas tactical weapons aren't. I mean, this will be a bad exchange. We've got these 20,000 Soviet tanks, but, you know, the Yom Kippur War shows to some extent that the tank is becoming an increasingly difficult weapon if you have, you know, missiles at home on heat or home on sound and so on. Uh, I mean, what I think has happened in NATO, I just will say this, is that the weaponry recently has much strengthened the position of the defense in warfare, really, developments in weaponry. And I mean, some, something like the cruise missile, which has been developed by the United States, enormously <coughs> strengthens the firepower of any defensive position. And, I mean, the cruise missile is a basically a defensive weapon and not an offensive one. But the, um, I think that Europeans would always have doubts about mutual force reductions that um, involved, you know, American troops going back to the United States, whereas Soviet troops went back, simply went back to Russia. I mean, you know, Russia's a lot nearer. Well, I think, yes, I, I don't think, you know, I mean, personally, I don't think that mutual force reductions will get anywhere because the Russians are in a position where they absolutely have to keep troops in Czechoslovakia, Poland, and East Germany. And, you know, um, they have to keep them there in fairly large numbers. And uh, so I don't think that will get, get anywhere very much. But, um, uh, I mean, Yes, I mean, naturally, Europeans do feel that, you know, certain reductions in, uh, you know, American forces in Europe might reflect unfavorably on them. Of course they do. And, uh, but I think at the minute, as I say, the position of NATO is rather more favorable than it's been for some time, but these are due to developments in military technology. And, I mean, in a way, the same developments are sort of making enormous holes in the arms control agreements, really, because it now is becoming extremely difficult. I mean, the, the strategic posture of the Soviet Union and of the United States are so asymmetrical 
that it's becoming increasingly difficult to get equivalent reductions, because they're not equivalent, in fact. That's one thing. And secondly, of course, that, you know, the money, I mean, you, you know, you agree not to have underground nuclear explosions. The money you save on that simply goes into the development of laser weapons or something else. In other words, you know, wherever, whatever you agree not to do, I mean, there are so many technological opportunities at the minute. You have the electronic bat, so-called electronic battlefield. You have cruise missiles. You have laser beams. You have the developments of all these weapons that can, you know, so-called smart bombs and this, that, and the other. And even in your, you know, if you, could, if you can get a foot more accuracy, even in your intercontinental ballistic missiles, it will buy you a great deal in terms of strategic advantage, and it will cost you every bit as much as developing a whole new generation of missiles.